Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, dear FIFA, and uh, good afternoon, dear participants of the seminar. I'm really happy to welcome you the presentation of the results of the uh, results of the research of, about the impact of COVID on HIV and tuberculosis services in the ECA region. It was conducted by Matahari Global, uh, initiated by the Alliance of Public health under the SOS project of the Global Fund. Uh, the ECA is the most uh, complicated region for these three, uh, for, 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 for these diseases. Bosnia and Ukraine are world leaders in terms of mortality of COVID. And Ukraine is uh, in top five in the world in terms of uh, the duration of MDR-TB treatment. And uh, Russia is also very problematic. The um, study covered uh, several countries of our region. We try to ensure some regional diversity and uh, regional specifics as it could be expected. Uh, the researchers saw cutting down of the resources to fight uh, these, uh, these diseases, reduction of case finding of HIV and uh, tuberculosis, reduction of prevention, prevention services. But the most important uh, thing the study was able to identify is a different thing. Uh, it is the innovative uh, solutions that have drastically changed uh, healthcare approaches uh, because of the crisis. Those um, solutions are late, but we saw actually that in Kyrgyzstan patients could use their smartphones to check not just the social media, but also the uh, advice from the patient groups and uh, consultations from doctors. We saw the birth of mass telemedicine. We also saw patients from the villages in Georgia receiving uh, tuberculosis services because labs came to work with them and it had never happened before. We saw how convenient it was that the patient in, in St. Petersburg could order electronic delivery, not just of his food as it used to be, and that's something we are all quite used to, but also used the electronic prescription to receive HIV treatment drugs. We applauded to the fact that after years of uh, uh, fighting uh, for avoiding to have daily travels uh, for ART drugs or for OST drugs, sorry, uh, almost all uh, Ukrainian patients could get uh, several uh, weeks uh, worth of um, stock of uh, OST drugs. And we also saw some features of the new standard of the healthcare system. It's no investment in uh, expensive laboratory buildings and uh, traveling to doctors and stuff like that. That's a new standard. And that's uh, something we are all focused on, patient. Um, the most active engagement of the patient at his home or wherever he or she is. That's time and money saving approach using new innovative technologies, integration, taking care of several parallel diseases and uh, removing parallel systems. That's also mobility and promptness in both procurement and delivery of uh, goods and services. So that This study is a very um, impressive story of to, tomorrow, actually, FIFA, Pavel and other colleagues, thank you very much for these extremely interesting results and we are looking forward to the presentation and to the reaction to these uh, results and the next step will be creating a new standard of healthcare in our region. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be moderating this panel today. Each and every panelist um, has provided us with crucial information that informed this study. So, so let's go into it. But before that, some housekeeping. Uh, I see that the housekeeping remarks have been posted in the chat, but I, I just want to remind everyone to rename your name um, in Zoom in the following format. Make sure it's first name and then last name and in brackets your country. Um, and uh, it, it's also important to know that this event is available in Russian and English. To select your desired language, just go to the bottom of your screen on Zoom 
and um, you can select, it's a, it's a picture of a globe, and you can select uh, your desired language for any operating system. Um, when you click on the little globe feature, you will see a list of Russian or English, and you can choose whatever you prefer. And when you choose your language, please also click the button that says mute original sound. Um, I would like to kindly remind you to mute your microphone if you're not speaking. Um, our administrator will be monitoring just in case there is any background sound and will mute you, but we ask for your kind consideration to your mics as well. Just to note as well that the meeting will be recorded and it will be published at the SOS Project Facebook page, uh, just in case you're interested in sharing later. I will also announce two polls during the meeting at different times to ask for your opinion on how we can improve HIV services. So that will happen during the meeting and it will come up on the screen and I'll announce them at the correct times. Um, also a reminder to the speakers that we have a very tight schedule and please keep to your time. And I will remind you if you're close to reaching your time. Um, so our first speaker, um, is Dr. Sinisha Skoshibusic, who is at the front line in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the COVID response. So, so he, he may need to go quite quickly after his presentation. So I would ask everyone, if you have questions for Dr. Skoshibusic, please write it in the, in the chat or raise your hand and we'll take a couple of questions right after his presentation instead of at the end. So we can ask him right after his presentation and get those questions answered. So um, let's get right into it. Dr. Skocibusic, you have the floor. Um, hello, everybody. I'm uh, happy. Thank you, FIFA, for your kind introduction. I uh, have to expo epo uh, apologize since I'm not able to stay all the time during the seminar, but uh, I will be available for the questions after I give a speech. And also I'm available at my email for any uh, questions that may arise after this uh, webinar. Uh, the questions that I would like to speak uh, today are first to give a short description of the situation with antiretrovirus in Bosnia-Herzegovina. You know that Bosnia-Herzegovina is 3.5 million country in um, Southeast uh, Europe, and we had a recent uh, a, a war that has devastating uh, effects on our healthcare system in general. Now our healthcare system is recovered, but it is very divided between many administrative units and many levels of uh, uh, governing uh, in a healthcare system. So antiretroviral treatment is also sharing those difficulties that the whole system is very divided in many, uh, in many country regions. Uh, at least uh, there are three uh, healthcare funds that finance uh, the antiretrovirals and um, the uh, level of rights for the people living with HIV is not equal in, any, in uh, every part of the country. Uh, in, um, Bosnia-Herzegovina is composed of two entities. One is a Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina and another is Republic of Srpska. And also there is a small unit called District Vrčko. In those three units, there are three funds that fin finance antiretrovirus. And the, the list of um, uh, available antiretrovirus is, I would like to say, um, a very, the richest or the most in numbers in Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. But in uh, District of Brčko and the Republic of Srpska, the list is much shorter. Um, also, since the, in Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the treatment is centralized in two medical centers and um, one center has a, a availability of all antiretrovirals, while another uh, medical center has only limited access to the antiretrovirals. For now, there is a reform of the system 
that has been um, started and at least uh, all patients in one administrative unit will be able to have approach to the same uh, antiretrovirus. Uh, considering uh, the fact that uh, this um, uh, COVID impact is, you, uh, somebody noticed in the beginning that Bosnia-Herzegovina is one country that is hardly, uh, uh, very hard affected by um, COVID. We have now uh, uh, pandemics that has uh, increased. Um, our hospitals are full of patients. Daily, uh, many people are dying. And this is also something that affects uh, HIV treatment in general in the country. Since HIV treatment is uh, doing uh, is going uh, to be in future, and also it's like this, uh, uh, focused on the infectious diseases specialist, and infectious diseases specialists are all into the business of doing uh, treating COVID, so. All other infectious diseases beside COVID are a little bit neglected. One of the reasons is because the capacities, bed capacities in hospitals for admissions and for a regional, uh, 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 for the occasional uh, uh, medical exams, uh, everything is reduced. So in Tuzla, almost all clinic has been changed to the COVID hospital. And in Sarajevo, significant number of uh, beds has been changed to the uh, COVID hospital. Uh, this is the reason why we, uh, in these pandemics, had a shortened uh, way of oper op operating. And, um, but I would um, must say, and uh, to, I would also like to say that I am happy that, um, no one was lost with their uh, antiretrovirals. Everybody got their therapy, but there were significant problems how to reach the therapy because at one uh, part of the year 2020, we also have a so strict lockdown that people could not travel to the hospitals to pick the antiretrovirals. Also, on the other side, uh, we have uh, uh, one major problem, and that is HIV screening. For, um, for previous years, we had a great global fund project that was fin fi funds financing all the HIV pr uh, pr uh, activities for more than 10 years, with some extension, some uh, period of uh, transition, and so on. But after that, all uh, activities have been uh, shrink, so to say. So only those who have been very much involved in HIV activities, not too many uh, NGOs participated in those HIV screening. And uh, we believe that at the moment, there are uh, more than 230 patients enrolled in HIV treatment. But we believe that there are many undetected people and we are not reaching the goals of World Health Organization to detect more people. Also, since these uh, problems um, are present, we have also a problem that people are not enrolled on time because the, this principle to enroll to treatment patients immediately, that's a little bit a problem. But we hope that with this um, idea that also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have a very short um, uh, um, to say access to the vaccines. Not too many people have been vaccinated. And um, me personally, I'm personally uh, very afraid of what's going to be in the future because the pandemics cannot stop without uh, uh, enough vaccines. There, there have been many um, projects that are ongoing and uh, some are making uh, clinical guidelines to treatment uh, for uh, HIV treatment. We also um, uh, gave uh, contacts with uh, some uh, cities like Bielina, Sarajevo and uh, Mostar 
concerning HIV that signed the Paris Declaration. And that there is, in, uh, I would say, enough awareness about HIV problem. But in this COVID situation, it is very hard. And um, one good thing is that HIV patients are treated uh, equally to other patients when COVID is concerned. But nevertheless, they have their problems uh, anyway. And we are hoping that in future, there will be more support from our local government and more support from the outside uh, uh, companies or uh, benefactors who will give uh, more strength to the reform of the system and especially give um, uh, emphasis to the HIV screening. And uh, thank you very much once again uh, for your interest in these topics in Bosnia-Herzegovina and I'm uh, at your disposal for any questions. Thank you so much, Doctor. And um, of course, we're opening up for questions now. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I've got. I've got actually a question, but um, let, let's see um, if anyone from the floor would like to ask the question. So we've got a question from Nadia Yanhol, who's asking, "What is the reason for insufficient vaccination for COVID? Is it the refusal of people, or insufficient amount of vaccines in the country?" At the moment, there is an insufficient amount of vaccines in the country, and uh, all the vaccines that come, they uh, are in few days used because there is enough people who want to take vaccines. Uh, maybe in the later phase, when uh, many people are vaccinated, the anti-vaxxers will arise then. But now we don't have enough uh, uh, COVID vaccines at our disposal. Thanks so much, Doctor. Is there any other questions? I have a question, actually. I remember you telling me that the health system wasn't strong enough for, for the COVID pandemic. Um, could you explain why the health system isn't strong enough? First of all, our uh, uh, health system is very uh, uh, segmented and um, the, the money, the funds are spent on many places for many small hospitals and um, uh, in total the amount of money that is given per patient in all the country is not um, uh, high enough to provide high quality medicine as we uh, learn from uh, uh, West countries uh, books, textbooks, we use all the medical equipment that is made in the Western countries, and it is uh, lots of money. Only people uh, or only doctors and nurses are paid by the local teams. So that's the reason why our um, healthcare system is not strong enough to provide as our patients are expecting from us, because on Google, they see the latest therapies, they see the latest diagnostics, but we have to know that the latest therapies is expensive. And unfortunately in Bosnia-Herzegovina, we are still spending many, lots of money uh, uh, in percentages for original drugs, antiretroviral drugs, while um, uh, generics are not available. And that's one of the major, I would say, uh, one of the major possibilities to make some um, uh, to make some savings and uh, have uh, the, to expand the list of available antiretrovirals. Thanks so much, Dr. Skutjebusic. Um, and, and if there are no more, more questions, oh, there, there is uh, another question. We'll take that one before we go on to to more on Bosnia and Herzegovina. How has the COVID pandemic affected access of vulnerable groups, example, MSM and sex workers to diagnostic and prevention services? First of all, it would be interesting to say that COVID pandemic is not uh, to say um, saving any group of people. So uh, vulnerable groups 
like MSM and sex workers are affected with the uh, uh, COVID the same as the other, uh, as general population. But since there are, um, since there are um, restrictions on gatherings and uh, those restrictions are, ve are very different from country to country and so on, it is uh, not easy to, uh, uh, to approach to find a good way to approach to MSM or sex workers. And also there is a significant, uh, um, from our experience from the field, we see that sex workers number is decreasing uh, uh, in comparison to previous years, we had much more sex workers, but uh, MSM population is, um, uh, sex workers is decreasing, decreasing and uh, MSM is increasing and uh, that's the one reason why diagnostic and prevention services are hard to reach now is just because the people are still under stigma and auto stigma too. And also with the uh, objective restrictions that are given by the local lockdown. Thanks so much for that response. We have to move on our next speaker now. So thank you very much for your time, Dr. Skocibusic. Thank you, um, and I wish and you a pleasant today. work today. Thanks so much. I'd like to introduce uh, Dennis Dedajic right now, who is Executive Director of Association Margina based in Tuzla, and he works with vulnerable populations. So um, Dennis, you have the floor and you're welcome to share your slides. Thank you, FIFA. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm put my presentation. And uh, one more explanation about the previous uh, uh, question uh, affected the population, uh, sex workers, especially it's an economic affected uh, population on uh, this uh, our vulnerable uh, groups okay today uh, i have a few slides and uh, i'm uh, talking about the transition uh, social contracting and the harm reduction uh, situation in bosnia herzegovina it's uh, our view from uh, people who provide uh, services uh, for uh, three population, uh, people who use drugs, uh, uh, sex workers, and uh, people in prisons. Uh, it's uh, our view on uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 on services. Uh, needle and syringes uh, program were very heavily uh, affected and uh, we have changed uh, totally our uh, methodology of the work and uh, we use uh, more uh, than uh, 40 uh, our uh, clients uh, to work with us and uh, uh, to try to, to disperse our services uh, in a small uh, 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 part of the towns and uh, people who are living uh, out, outside of, of the uh, uh, towns. Uh, <clears throat> the av availability of the needles and syringes as well uh, and other uh, materials in this period, it's very huge. This is uh, primarily uh, due to the shutdown of all other services that operate in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We are last Mohicans uh, who, who work uh, in the field and we are working in uh, two, two regions and uh, cover more than one million people in uh, Tuzla and Zemsa regions. Uh, also, all our services, uh, it's uh, accredited from the uh, state uh, uh, agency for accreditation in the health sector. Uh, we have only uh, enough uh, materials for uh, maybe two two more months 
to the end of the, the May. People who served in, in our program, six uh, uh, professionals and uh, 40 volunteers, uh, also don't pay from the middle of the 2019. Uh, we, are, we are like a civil society organization also affected with uh, uh, COVID. Currently, we cover uh, 200 and 400 uh, people in, in this capacity with the services. Uh, 100 and 800 uh, people who use drugs, 300 uh, sex workers, and 300 uh, prisoners. Uh, and all our activities, it's, it's uh, uh, very familiar and the, the uh, methodology, it's, it's uh, uh, prepared uh, with uh, all restriction from uh, crisis staff. Uh, with our families, we had aces, eight cases of infection and two deaths due, due to uh, call, uh, this period of the, the COVID-19. However, we don't stop working and as long as we have the, the material. We urgently need a donor who will support us in the coming period so uh, that the last services would uh, not be shut down. We believe that the main consultants, FIFA and, and the other, will uh, highlight the main weaknesses such as uh, weak healthcare, uh, healthcare system, poor global funds transition, impact on HIV care, disruption of the needle and syringe services, social contracting uh, laws to increase uh, HIV and uh, TB support services, take home doses for OST and take home naloxone and or naltrexone for people who use drugs. Uh, shortly about uh, our services, according uh, uh, a civil society organization working out of the two cantons uh, and uh, we have cover approximately 15,000 people who inject drugs in the country with the heroin being the predominant injecting drugs. Uh, there we have uh, two drop-in centers in Zenz and Tuzla that work on harm reduction including the exchange and distribution of the equipment providing information, counseling, field work, and the distribution of the, the condoms uh, in, in all population. While official uh, data uh, in the last three years, uh, HIV cases are allowed among uh, 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 people who use drugs from 2018 to 2020, HIV infections increased by 13% uh, among uh, this population, indicating a need for sustained harm reduction services. A lack of available donor funding means that over 2,400 vulnerable individuals who received uh, our services have not no access to support uh, uh, services. These people, people who use uh, drugs, uh, sex workers and prisoners are really on the edge of the disaster. Uh, uh, in this period of the pandemic, if we close these services, these people don't have opportunity, not only for the needles and syringes, we are referral point for all other services for our client, for social, health, legal, and etc. cetera. Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, it's one of the first uh, uh, countries who uh, create the uh, transition uh, document uh, and the country uh, coordinating mechanism create a really proper and then the good document for, for our situation after the, the, the global fund. But the problem was there was no funding from, from the government and the uh, no any allocation for the implementation of uh, this plan. This plan, uh, transition plan, plan expired in 2017, and uh, our uh, recommendation, it's a creation 
a totally completely new transition plan which will be budgeted based on the needs coming uh, fr from the field and will be fully funded by the state. Our modest estimate is that for uh, such a limited program, we need about 1.0 million uh, euros uh, per year. And social contracting, uh, it's uh, from uh, many of this, maybe it's a totally uh, strange uh, uh, word. Uh, social contracting it's a, um, a mechanism uh, to uh, to be uh, uh, open uh, public funds uh, for uh, civil society organization and uh, uh, create the, the contacts with, with the governments and provide social uh, primarily social and, and health services for uh, all uh, needed uh, population. At the, the time of, of uh, writing uh, this uh, short presentation, civil society organizations are advocating for health uh, uh, partnership through the SOS uh, uh, project to en enable a social contact mechanism for services, uh, service delivery. In the previous period, uh, our organization through the budget advocacy program try to influence the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Social Policy in order to, to start drafting this law. Pandemic stopped everything. Uh, we are sent the uh, change uh, like uh, uh, one of the, the pre-mechanism pre of the uh, uh, social contracting. We are sent uh, change, uh, amending the uh, law of exceeds uh, duties. Uh, and uh, we are focused on the exceeds on tobacco and tobacco, tobacco product, products. And uh, our uh, mm, draft uh, law uh, staying in the state parliament uh, more than two years. Uh, with the, this uh, changing and amendment uh, of uh, this law, uh, we uh, need 5% uh, of uh, all access duties on tobacco and uh, and i'm said one one sentence finally uh, with this 5% uh, it's uh, approximately 22 million uh, euros per year we want to to uh, uh, fund and the budget budgeting uh, this type of the services for HIV and TB and the fund, special fund for uh, uh, kids and, and the youth who uh, have a serious diseases and the treatment uh, this this uh, young people. Sorry for a uh, long presentation and uh, I'm open for your questions. Thanks so much, Dennis, and it's incredibly concerning that NACP programs are running out of funds. Um, so you can stay till the end of the presentation. So what we're going to do is take your questions at the end. And please, um, any participants, if you have any questions for Dennis, um, please type it in the chat and Dennis will see if he can answer as well in the chat as well. So let's go um, to Moldova now. Um, I'm very pleased now to um, introduce to you Lilian Severin, who is the executive director of AFI, um, who serves homeless populations and other vulnerable groups um, in Chisinau. Um, and he'll be talking to you about serving homeless populations during the COVID-19 pandemic. So Dennis, if you can uh, stop sharing screen just so that uh, Lilian can start sharing. Please. Thanks. Lilian, you have to
decided to, to make a little bit uh, wider picture of uh, uh, working with vulnerable populations in Moldova, because we have uh, several uh, organizations uh, serving these uh, populations and uh, being um, the secretary of the platform of NGOs in Moldova, uh, working uh, in the field of TB. Um, let's say I have the mandate to describe more um, uh, widely uh, what happened. So uh, um, the platform of uh, uh, NGOs active in the field of uh, TB control was founded in, uh, uh, founded in uh, 2013. Um, at the moment, we include nine organizations. Um, we are represented uh, uh, in the CCM. Uh, we also uh, um, work uh, within the uh, um, CAP committee, uh, Key Affected Populations uh, Committee. Um, at the moment, uh, the organizations that are um, uh, within the platform are mostly uh, service providers, but we also uh, work Um, our first role is to um, obtain access to extremely um, vulnerable uh, groups of populations. So we work with homeless, we work with uh, IDUs, um, we work with uh, um, poor rural populations, we work uh, um, with um, people uh, affected by uh, alcohol addiction. Um, and we focus within this platform on, uh, on uh, TB control. Uh, I mentioned that before. Uh, we also uh, work on um, uh, decrease of stigma and discrimination of TB patients and uh, people affected by TB. Uh, we work to develop partnerships uh, with stakeholders on different levels, um, beginning with grassroots levels uh, and uh, ending up with uh, 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 ministries. Um, we um, take part in the development of planning and health uh, healthcare policies. Um, we take part in promotion of the comprehensive TB treatment. Um, we also participate in uh, the monitoring and the evaluation uh, uh, of uh, uh, our uh, uh, TB uh, programs. Um, as regarding the COVID-19 in Moldova, we are um, uh, within the uh, first 10 countries uh, according to the um, DEF um, uh, uh, per capita. Um, the pandemic uh, uh, is characterized with a gradual growth of disease burden uh, since its beginning. and. Um, Sure, it affected um, the access to TB services uh, in Moldova. Uh, extremely vulnerable populations were affected uh, uh, in a uh, much more, in a greater way uh, than uh, uh, than other groups of population. Um, why uh, um, access to TB services were? Uh, Mm, uh, were restricted uh, during COVID time. Uh, we have several um, uh, reasons. Um, uh, the um, significant barriers um, uh, of uh, patients' access to medical institutions included um, increased uh, workload on uh, uh, medical staff, uh, increased uh, load on X-ray facilities, because COVID uh, uh, is still uh, actually um, um, imposing um, very difficult uh, conditions uh, in our X-ray um, uh, facilities. Um, uh, now we have endless queues um, uh, generated by the pandemic and we uh, uh, face difficulties in, uh, in bringing our beneficiaries to, to X-ray screening for TB. Uh, patients uh, fear to get infected of TB, of COVID-19, I'm sorry. Um, 
uh, COVID-19 imposed limitation of, uh, of uh, uh, working, limitation of, uh, uh, of um, uh, on, on transportation, uh, on movement, um, and uh, different kind of limitations that uh, uh, made uh, life uh, more difficult for our groups, uh, for our uh, vulnerable groups. Um, uh, personal protection items uh, are not very available uh, among uh, uh, poor people, among homeless. Um, um, and um, as I said, uh, one of the barriers uh, to access medical services were, was the uh, limited transportation uh, uh, during the emergency situations that were uh, imposed uh, two times in Moldova since March uh, 2020. Uh, there are also uh, social and economical barriers um, in face of uh, vulnerable populations during uh, COVID times. Uh, so we noticed that uh, incomes uh, uh, reduced drastically um, because uh, um, the first of all because of uh, uh, less um, less jobs available on uh, on the market um, um, homeless people faced uh, uh, even greater lack of housing uh, they were um, often um, um, forbidden to spend their uh, um, uh, the night in uh, in their dwelling places uh, by police um, we faced the same uh, uh, situation with uh, sex workers that were uh, more often monitored by police uh, in the place where they usually uh, provide their services. Um, we also noticed that um, um, vulnerable groups of populations had less access to soup kitchens, to, uh, to the mechanisms of uh, food distribution uh, because of the imposed uh, restrictions. Um, as a result of low access to TB services, uh, we um, had a decreased, um, um, decreased detection uh, during 2020, so we uh, had uh, a detection that um, uh, was uh, only 61% uh, compared to the figure uh, of uh, uh, 2019. Um, as a result, these alarming uh, trends um, gave us the possibility to involve um, to involve uh, um, civil society organizations into uh, providing access or removing barriers um, uh, to TB services in Moldova. So um, uh, during 2020, there were funds, supplementary funds allocated uh, uh, by Global Fund um, for uh, active TB case fi finding among uh, among vulnerable populations. Um, there were uh, guidelines developed for uh, CSOs <clears throat> describing the work uh, within uh, um, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, conditions, um, describing uh, uh, ways uh, uh, or describing the protection, personal protection, describing uh, uh, how to implement outreach work in the field uh, during COVID-19. Um, there were selected uh, eight districts uh, and two municipalities uh, with the highest uh, TB burden uh, in Moldova. Um, um, this, uh, this selection was, was uh, performed in collaboration with the National TB program. Um, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, issued, um, published uh, an, uh, a regulation uh, describing um, the process of um, uh, TB case finding uh, during COVID-19, describing as well the role of NGOs, describing the role of uh, um, primary healthcare network and the role of uh, uh, TB services. So. Uh, uh, 
the country planned to cover 1,200 uh, um, uh, people um, during uh, three months, uh, during last three months of uh, 2020. Um, from this budget allocated by the Global Fund. Uh, and um, uh, at the end, we, uh, we screened uh, uh, four times more. We screened uh, 5,185 people uh, and we detected uh, 57 uh, uh, TB cases. Um, that was, I think, a good result. And uh, in order to obtain this, uh, we had to work uh, on different levels. And some of the aspects uh, um, of the involvement of uh, CSOs in the TB detection uh, are, first of all, methodological support uh, of the national TB program. We had to uh, work uh, in a very close collaboration with the NTP because uh, we had to identify uh, the most um, affected areas. We had to validate our uh, um, detected cases. Um, uh, we had, in order to implement the TB detection, um, we had to uh, have a very close collaboration with local authorities in order to present our, uh, our um, intentions in order to obtain local resources um, uh, and uh, to obtain, for example, uh, the X-ray uh, time uh, in the administrative uh, division of, uh, of uh, Moldova in a particular place, let's say. Uh, we had to work uh, um, very closely with the uh, with, uh, uh, TB doctors um, and uh, with the uh, uh, primary um, healthcare network in order to obtain uh, high quality lists of, uh, uh, of people that uh, um, uh, had to be um, subsequently uh, accompanied to, uh, to the X-ray facility. Um, we also had to involve uh, other stakeholders uh, like community leaders, like social uh, um, services uh, from time to time, some uh, police officers in order to get access uh, or to, uh, to have uh, um, more efficiency uh, in uh, our work. Um, we also uh, um, implemented activities for TB treatment support uh, in 2020. Um, we uh, were distributing drugs to patients uh, uh, in order to facilitate the uh, um, directly observed treatment at home, home-based treatment. Um, uh, these beneficiaries, 90 patients, included homeless people as well, uh, people living in very poor conditions, or people who were not able to um, uh, to walk or to, to go to the TB cabinet. Um, we um, also implemented um, informational and psychological support to the patients uh, in, in hospitals. Uh, and we um, implemented video supported treatment for about 250 patients. And um, that was also a, um, an interesting development in, uh, in Moldova because uh, uh, due to the situation, very difficult situation connected with uh, COVID-19, we were finally able uh, to uh, start the video supported treatment. Uh, in Moldova. Um, as a result of all these activities that I described uh, in 2020, we obtained the synergy and uh, the, the inertia to, uh, to plan 
to have bold plans for 2021. So um, uh, you can see that uh, we will have more organizations uh, involved in uh, TB screening and uh, uh, tr TB treatment support. Um, we'll have nine organizations in 2021. We'll cover 26 administrative units uh, compared, to, compared to nine in uh, 2020. We plan to screen about more than 15,000 um, uh, people for, from vulnerable uh, groups. Um, we plan to support uh, more than 500 patients um, uh, that will be included in treatment. Uh, and we plan to expand uh, uh, the video supported treatment uh, to 640 patients uh, in 2021. Um, our goals for the next. Uh, uh, We're slightly over time. Can you can you um, yeah. go through these slides? Yeah, uh, I'm wrapping up. Uh, our main goals for the next periods uh, are um, further mobilization of resources to broad uh, to broad uh, coverage of vulnerable populations, uh, mobilization of resources for social support to vulnerable populations. Uh, we need to eliminate the barriers uh, to X-ray examination because uh, the, uh, the burden on, on uh, X-ray facilities is great now. We need uh, national coordination of, uh, of um, X-ray uh, allocation and um, uh, organization. Um, we have to work on uh, uh, decrease of stigma and discrimination uh, of TB patients. Um, we have to work on uh, um, state financing uh, of uh, TB NGOs in Moldova. We had the first experience last year and we hope that uh, we'll get more funding this year. Uh, and we should uh, integrate into our work, into our TB work uh, as well, HIV prevention services. And uh, we have to train our staff. This is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lilian, and thanks so much for um, showing how important NGOs um, are in the TB response um, in Moldova. Um, there are a couple of questions for you, but I think we'll, uh, I'll ask you to answer in them in the chat, or we, you can answer them during the question and answer session. To right now, we have to move to Georgia, uh, where we'll hear really interesting uh, innovations in TB, as well as what happened to harm reduction. So let's start with the presentation of Nino Longtadze, the Head of Surveillance from the National Center for TB and Lung Disease. Nino, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Do you see my screen that I just shared? We do see your screen. Yes. Okay. No, thank you. So my today's presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to thank to FIFA and the organizers of the conference for inviting me to speak on this very important workshop. It's a pleasure for me. So my today's presentation will be on sustaining essential TB control services and interventions uh, through innovations during the COVID-19 era. But before moving to those innovations, let's have a quick uh, view on the epidemiological uh, trends and uh, situation in the country. As you see from this slide, tuberculosis absolute number of cases has been decreasing over the last 15 years. And if we compare to 2010, it's almost three times decrease uh, in 2020, but let's not uh, really uh, make comparison to 2020. It's more than 50% decrease uh, throughout uh, last uh, 10 years if we compare to 2019 data. What happened in 2020 in comparison with 2019 is presented in this slide where we see that uh, there has been a 26% decrease in the absolute number of drug sensitive tuberculosis cases and 28% decrease in the absolute number of 
RR MDR TB cases in 2020 if compared to 2019. It should be mentioned that Georgia was observing decrease of tuberculosis cases over uh, many years, and the decrease was varying from 5 to 12 percent on average, or 5 to 10 percent uh, every year. But we see that the impact of COVID-19 is huge in this case of case det of decrease of case detection, which is. Uh, 26% and 28 for sensitive and rifampicin resistant TB cases, respectively. The treatment outcomes, uh, however, it should be mentioned that we do not yet see a big impact on treatment outcomes of COVID-19 on uh, of TB patients. Specifically, here we see the cohort of 2019 patients and the treatment success is similar as it was in previous years. It's 84%. We don't, we have 5% loss to follow up, 3% failure, 4% died and 4% not yet evaluated. Similarly, in uh, if we look at the treatment outcomes of uh, patients registered in 2018, but we know that uh, rifampicin resistant TB patients are almost treated for, for uh, almost for 18 to 20 months. So the treatment outcome uh, is not really different from previous years when we, uh, and we have 67% treatment success among uh, rifampicin resistant TB patients. 12% of loss to follow up, which is actually even less then we usually have loss to follow-up rate among RRMDRTB. For instance, for the cohort of 2017, it was 21%. But let's see, we, we do believe that the innovations and the programmatic approaches that took place in the country could impact the treatment outcomes, but of course we had very negative impact of COVID-19 on case detection. So um, uh, one of the activity that was actually implemented long before COVID-19. This is the video supported treatment before we were calling it VOT, video observed treatment. Now WHO has renamed this intervention to the VST or video supported treatment. And we started to implement this approach for just MDRTB patients in 2016. Then in 2017, Georgia started to implement a special dedicated application developed by the in-country developers, specifically for the uh, NTP Georgia with uh, robust management powered with visual aids to streamline review of the reported cases in the application. Also, it has additional controls uh, for administration administrators of the application over prescription management, such as posing particular drugs due to side effects or adverse events, or even enabling in patient mode. VST allowed patients to take drugs convenient for them time, and during COVID-19 it was vastly used, up to 100% um, uh, of patients of MDRTB patients were taking drugs through VST, and it is convenient because in comparison with the facility-based DOT, patients could take drugs uh, in during convenient for them time and sometimes even before going to bed. Access to Wi-Fi or mobile data is not necessary during recording the drug intake if the patient is opting for using the um, uh, application because we have other options of uh, VOT as well, or VST by using Viber or WhatsApp. Some patients are opting for them, but majority of patients are using the application. So this application doesn't require a device to be under internet coverage, but uh, if the device falls under Wi-Fi or mobile data coverage within 24 hours since, since the recording of the drug intake video was made, this will be uploaded to the cloud. So far, more than 1,400 patients have received full course of treatment through VST with 2% loss to follow-up rate. And we, if we compare this loss to follow-up rate to the overall loss to follow-up rate that I have just showed, of course, this is much less uh, for the video observed uh, patients. 
During 2020, during COVID-19 pandemic, Sweet for Georgia started on 26th of February of 2020. A complete network of anti-TB anti uh, providers uh, have been mobilized. Uh, since March 2020, all patients who were on ambulatory treatment have been transferred to the remote DOT treatment, including uh, BSD as a major option for uh, undertaking DOT. Patients were provided with a one-month supply of prescribed anti-tuberculosis medications, uh, and these medications were delivered to them by program vehicles and in big cities by program nurses who are using public transport. 90% of drug-resistant TB patients and 30% of sensitive TB patients received and are still receiving anti-tuberculosis treatment using video-supported treatments. Physicians and nurses hold regular telephone communications with patients to assess and manage general condition and uh, evaluate adverse events if such was occurring. Also, every newly diagnosed TB patient is receiving free of charge dramatically from the very early stages of the COVID-19 epidemics. During March uh, to May 2020, the um, treatment policy guidelines have been developed. Uh, so 2020 was very productive year in this point of view because also WHO was updating and providing the new guidelines and the policy changes. So in uh, step-by-step with WHO country has updated several guidelines. We have updated guideline on tuberculosis management in children, guideline on LTBI management. Also uh, a clinical management protocol was uh, developed for tuberculosis and COVID-19 co-infection. This protocol was developed in collaboration with the Infectious Diseases, AIDS and Clinical Immunology Center in Georgia and a National Tuberculosis Program. Also, we have started development uh, and elaboration of the pulmonary rehabilitation guideline back in 2019, which was approved in 2020. And uh, it should be, despite the very busy and intense and uh, um, difficult period, the Ministry of Health has very swiftly discussed and approved those guidelines that were developed by the National Tuberculosis Program in 2020. Another approach that have been used for clinical uh, coaching or mentorship of, uh, 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 of city and regional and district TB doctors is ECHO Concilium. This uh, is an innovative project ECHO, which is functioning in Georgia since um, 2018. And at the level of the Central MDO TB Concilium at the National Center for TB and Lung Diseases, this approach allows to improve patient care in rural and underserved areas and strengthen healthcare mm -hmm. work capacity through telemonitoring and distance learning programs, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Again, this innovation was not something initiated during COVID-19, but was of great help and, help and use and uh, had very positive impact on overall clinical management of tuberculosis cases countrywide. Uh, TB program and National Center for TB and Lung Diseases has also participated in the fight against COVID-19. Since February 2020, the center, uh, our center um, has been involved, um, uh, specifically the pediatric inpatient department has been temporarily repurposed to a quarantine facility until May 2020. Later, we were functioning as a fever center. And since September 2020 through February 2020, uh, this pediatric ward or uh, inpatient department was functioning as a COVID-19 inpatient treatment center. Also, there were separate patient beds that are, all, that are still functioning, uh, dedicated to TB patients co-infected with COVID-19 who might require inpatient, inpatient treatment. 
every admitted COVID-19 patient was actively screened for TB using gene expert testing if Sputnik was available and for LTBI using quantiferon TB gold test. And we are, we are now accumulating and analyzing those data. And part of the physiopulmonologists and nurses who work for TB were repurposed and involved in the operations of the COVID-19 treatment department and have returned back to their routine TB practice since March 2020. Challenges and solutions, this is my last slide. At the beginning of the pandemic, TB program uh, faced some insufficiencies, of course, as many other programs probably globally, of the infectious control materials, respirators, uh, um, et cetera. Uh, but this was uh, quickly eliminated by the Global Fund COVID-19 response for Georgia. Sorry, can, can somebody mute? Um. Yeah, I hear something. The need for increased financial support for infection control measures, especially in hospitals and intensive care units were there because we need to make the sectorization of patients now not between AFP positive and negative, but now COVID-19 positive and without COVID-19. Also, some solitary TB units were closed due to quarantine or due to being repurposed for COVID-19, which required effective patient referral and rerouting them to other, operat other operating TB facilities. Complete lockdown with no public or other transport allowed April May mm, mm, allowed in April May 2020 and November December 2020 greatly affected the potential patients' mobility and access to timely diagnosis and care, and thus negatively impacted on TB case detection. In response, NTP is implementing active TB case finding program using the mobile X-ray vehicle equipped with the CAT4 TB artificial intelligence program for of X-ray interpretation and reading. And we have just in March has and have undertaken uh, this um, active case finding exercise in one of the rural areas of Tbilisi. Providing patients with a monthly supply of medications has, of course, minimized the risk of infecting with COVID-19 because they did not need to, tra to travel to DOT facilities for drug intake, but has negatively impacted the monthly scheduled doctor visits, which are also essential and uh, in order to monitor the treatment effectiveness and also safety. So the support of the community organizations was important in this regard. They were actively working with the patients and uh, 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 re, uh, reminding them about their monthly visits to the doctor that needs to be accomplished. I want to acknowledge you know, all the partners and doctors, dedicated TB doctors who are working during the COVID-19 pandemic in really an easy and challenging period to the TB patients who are still devoted to their treatment and uh, um, their care and also government and uh, other international partners. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nino. It's great to hear of all these innovations um, in Georgia and hopefully we see similar things occurring around the region as well. Um, and we'll get questions to you by the end of the program. But now let's go to the impact on harm reduction programs in Georgia. Uh, I'm introducing Maka Gogia from the Georgian Harm Reduction Network to present um, her uh, presentation. Maka, you have the floor. It's visible. So uh, some uh, 
background of the uh, program, uh, harm reduction program before COVID was uh, such. Uh, coverage of needle and syringe program was till 35,000 in 2019. Uh, that was equal to nine to 10,000 uh, coverage per month. Uh, coverage by OST program was uh, uh, 12,000 uh, um, till COVID. The number of uh, testing, HIV testing was 20,000. Um, and uh, nearly 60% of uh, needle and syringe program services was uh, delivered uh, at outreach, and we had no experience uh, to work under emergency, uh, no experience at methadone substitution program to deliver take home doses, uh, especially for five days. Well, I can't. Go to another slide. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, we had no readiness to pandemic situation. Uh, we had no equipment. I mean, medical masks, sanitizers, different safety uh, items, uh, um, uh, and. Even uh, uh, there was shortage of sterile uh, su supply materials in pharmacies, and it was uh, very difficult to procure them. Um, as well, um, um, uh, fear of contamination by COVID was uh, another challenge for uh, clients and harm reduction uh, program staff uh, itself. Um, and restriction of all types of transport. There was uh, public and uh, private uh, car um, restriction that was uh, that made unable for our clients to reach harm reduction sites, uh, uh, and uh, um, and we needed some time to obtain permissions for our mobile ambulance ambulances and outreach cars. Maybe one month was. Uh, left for that. Uh, um, uh, as uh, we, we are not ready to readjust to a new environment, we stopped HIV testing uh, on outreach uh, for, uh, for a month, uh, month period um, before we get, uh, got full equipment. Uh, accordingly, drug users uh, could not come them themselves uh, uh, to testing at uh, the office, uh, uh, of course. Uh, um, and um, um, another failure uh, and challenge was uh, regarding to screening. Uh, it was interrupting and detection of new HIV, hepatitis C and TB cases uh, was difficult uh, and as well linkage to care was uh, a challenge because all clinics that we are managing COVID patients, we are managing uh, HIV and hepatitis C diseases. Uh, Mm, initiation of treatment of uh, hepatitis C among uh, drug users also was challenging and uh, uh, for the already um, uh, started uh, treatment patients uh, had difficulties to reach uh, uh, to get uh, the drugs, uh, especially it was difficult to uh, get uh, to reach uh, uh, the hospitals from small cities to, to travel to big cities. Uh, this uh, this um, picture that shows uh, the challenging time of COVID, uh, starting from March, uh, you you see the coverage of drug users by the program, and you see that uh, three you know, the first three months uh, you know, we had uh, lower uh, coverage in comparison to the period that we had before. So nine to ten instead of nine to ten thousand clients, we reached half half of them only. Uh, this uh, number of HIV testing during the uh, first three months, and you can see that uh, it was very challenging period, and uh, it was maybe three, four times less than in previous months. Uh, as regarding to delivered syringes and uh, needles distributed per one program client, it was uh, accordingly increased as the number of clients itself were reduced. So as regarding to overdose, uh, we saw that uh, uh, no significant changes in terms of overdoses did not uh, happen uh, in comparison with other Western European countries. 
uh, we see that uh, you can see that a number of distributed analogs on, uh, remain the same in, as in previous year and uh, the total number of deaths because of overdose among program clients uh, was not increased. Uh, uh, the uh, ways to solve the problems uh, was different depending on the strategies. At first, uh, the guidance was created to support operation of needle and syringe programs, uh, including mobile ones. So uh, each program staff uh, was uh, educated what to do and uh, uh, how to react uh, per each ch challenge. Uh, we increased distributed uh, the number of distributed uh, sterile injecting equipment uh, uh, just uh, to ensure the minimization of contact with clients. Um, uh, there was adopted a new practice of take-home dose of methadone and buprenorphine for five days. Um, uh, there was only several interruptions um, uh, during the year, but so far this practice is maintained and uh, uh, we plan to advocate to keep this practice for well tiered clients. Um, um, during this period, the work of syringe bending machines, so-called Sigma machines, uh, was uh, operating in Tbilisi. Uh, and uh, we have 10 machines uh, here and they were distributing condoms, naloxone, pregnancy test, HIV self-test and especially kits for opioid users and stimulant uh, users. This intervention is being held uh, within French Five Initiative and with uh, Alternative Georgian and uh, Georgia and uh, GHRN and NCDC as well. So it was very uh, vivid that uh, the, uh, this model uh, of vending, the distributing materials are very effective during this uh, emergency situations. Um, uh, sterile equipment supplies were distributed to uh, harm reduction personnel and clients with the support of the Global Fund grant, among them regional grant, MDM France uh, and the FI, international organization FIND. Uh, from uh, May, the main way for needle and syringe uh, program service uh, delivery became outreach work and we rather restricted uh, um, uh, office services uh, and uh, preferred to provide services uh, uh, from mobile vans or from the window. Uh, online medical consultations became dominant uh, and uh, risk counseling and the referral services also was done by telephone uh, consultations. Uh, later in December 2020, Teleclinic as a supportive service for needle and syringe program uh, clients as well for MSM, uh, sex worker and other clients was developed by now our PR uh, within the Global Fund the program and uh, it's being uh, implementing even now. Uh, also training for harm reduction program personnel and meeting with peers, educators on COVID issues uh, was happening from the very uh, uh, start uh, phase of COVID-19. Information educational materials, so we are prepared both uh, mm -hmm. as printed versions and online versions uh, uh, and tablets uh, we are procured for, to support uh, outreach work uh, uh, and delivered to harm reduction sites. I try to be very <laughs> short in case of question, please, I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mata. That was really useful to hear. And I, for one, would be really interested to hear whether there were any challenges with the new technologies uh, that were in place. But let's see if we can uh, delay that to the question and answer session. So thanks very much. So we have Ukraine next, but before we go to Ukraine, um, we'd like to um, show you a poll. Um, and the poll um, asks, what are the biggest challenges in accessing HIV and TB services in your country in the COVID-19 time? And there are a few answers that you can pick. So I'm just waiting for, it should appear on your screen soon. Да, я пытаюсь включить видео, но... 
Yes, I'm trying to turn on the video, but for some reason it says that the organizers are not uh, uh, giving the rights to do that. Um, can you hear me well? Anton, we can hear you well, but there is... Can the organizers give me the right to share a video? Okay, uh, so we'll we'll um, we'll try to get the video turned on. Anton, there you are. Great. Okay, so there is a poll on your screen, and um, just pick the answer. And we've seen the answers there with the results. Um, so a lot of people are saying there's insufficient financial support of communities in TB and HIV. And I'll leave Pavel to discuss these uh, poll results later. But for now, um, let's go to Ukraine and let's ask Anton. Anton, could you explain to us how COVID has affected uh, access to services for HIV and OST patients in Ukraine? You have the floor. Yes, uh, good uh, afternoon, dear colleagues. I will be speaking Russian. Uh, the, the first half of the day, I've been speaking a lot in English, talking to the European Parliament um, members, and we had to discuss actually the same things. And I'm really sorry for uh, being here without a presentation, because unfortunately, I've joined another community now, it's a community of people affected by COVID. And uh, it's the 14th day of uh, since the onset uh, today, the 14th day of self-isolation, but that's a very dangerous disease. And this feeling of co constant weakness and uh, being um, incapable of doing something actively will remain with me for some time, I think. But uh, now it gives me a good excuse to look at uh, at a big picture and see uh, this uh, system from the inside because i didn't have unfortunately i wasn't able to get vaccinated in time but uh, our treatment system uh, let me be honest uh, it's not uh, uh, centered on key population members uh, and even like regular people struggle receiving certain services now. Unfortunately, according to our Minister of Health, our system of healthcare is fully overloaded at the moment and uh, all capacity is used. So the, 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 the we use the ox, ex, access to oxygen to maximum, we don't have any reserves left. And so Ukraine now is facing the third wave of COVID, but based on the numbers that we, that we saw, based on the numbers of new cases and the mortality that has increased, uh, that has doubled actually, plus younger people now get infected, I am afraid we are facing very dangerous times. And it should be noted that in this period, in this year, just one year since the first wave of uh, COVID, which started in the middle of March 2020, now it's April 2021, this year, Ukraine and the HIV services and the communities I belong to, they suffered not just from COVID, uh, they suffered from the realities of transition to governmental funding uh, because the basic package of uh, prevention services that included also testing and uh, mm, syringe dissemination and so on, it uh, had to be funded by the state. Let me also remind you that Ukraine is a country at war and in the east of the country. Yeah, and uh, now uh, the whole situation with IDPs, uh, with uh, members of key populations and economic um, burden of such a conflict, it uh, well does, does not open any opportunities. It is uh, really hindering our pro progress. But the most important thing I'd like to note is that uh, 
neither prevention services nor uh, ART services uh, or HIV testing or a HCV uh, treatment or TB treatment uh, have not been interrupted. And so that's the key uh, achievement uh, that we can note. But uh, with regard to the rest of uh, the situation, the, there have been numerous problems. So we remember that we are talking here about the criminalized and traditionally stigmatized and discriminated communities. Uh, that is in Ukraine, these are people who use drugs, sex workers, people living with HIV. And if you speak about um, some uh, legal limitations, yes, that uh, of course uh, restricts their access to any uh, state services, uh, healthcare or social support, whatever. But if uh, uh, the things, the problems like, um, I don't know, testing or um, syringe uh, needle exchange programs. Uh, we, we've been able to cope with them uh, by simply changing uh, the uh, approaches to the implementation, like uh, come to us, uh, seldom uh, get more at uh, harm reduction 2.0, increased role of mobile clinics who now are reaching the places they had never reached before to ensure uh, access, uh, online information, hotlines, um, courier delivery of drugs, uh, uh, then given stocks uh, of uh, uh, drugs, if you speak about ART and treatment of uh, hepatitis, giving you more uh, preparations uh, to, to, to to, to get treatment, we, we were able to cope. But uh, from what we see now, there was a great decrease in tests and, and it's based on the number of tests we, are, tests we are making now. We are returning more or less to the previous level. Also, the case finding has dropped. Uh, it was harder also for things like um, substitution maintenance therapy because we are speaking about controlled substances, but prenorphine, methadone, and here it's actually, well, the, the changes uh, in approach uh, it, it has, not, it has not always been a solution and uh, it required a lot of advocacy together with our partners with the uh, public health center with the Ministry of Health uh, in order to give this, uh, to deliver this uh, message to all the healthcare facilities that people who use drugs need to be involved in substitution therapy as much as possible during the COVID period. And those who are in it already, they need to receive stocks for unobserved administration of drugs. In Ukraine, uh, about 50% of people uh, had already been receiving up to 10 days stock for unobserved uh, treatment, but the COVID was uh, a window of opportunity and it uh, allowed us to increase such a percentage up to 90 or even 100% in some places. And uh, the stock would be for uh, 14, 15% in some days for 21 days even. But let's not forget that uh, we are speaking now about the basic needs, uh, basic uh, things we've been focusing on the services themselves, but we're speaking about basic needs of people, the access to which uh, was uh, greatly reduced. And uh, these are uh, food, employment, uh, transportation, uh, legal support, specific uh, health care support for representatives of uh, key populations and uh, really unfortunately in this area we didn't have a lot of success especially when it comes to uh, situations when uh, the, the support was really occasional and sometimes uh, the, the healthcare refused to hospitalize our people when they learned that those are drug users or people who live with HIV. Yesterday we learned from our ombudsperson that uh, uh, there were 62% more cases of uh, gender-based uh, violence and it was a known fact in our communities as well. And it's great that uh, different foundations uh, joined uh, with their investments, uh, some emergency funds, but uh, let me tell you, this uh, support comes um, late and uh, sometimes it's very episodical, uh, fragmented. 
And so now when we encountered uh, the, the situation when the, the mass transportation has been stopped in Kyiv, people are calling people who cannot reach uh, the OST site and uh, they um, they want to, yeah, they call, we, we, we've called the mayor's office, but our mayor is silent so far. So uh, we need help. I, I think I'm speaking for too long. Yeah, probably. So I should probably stop at this. You have two minutes and to answer my next question, which is how how do we improve? Because you mentioned there's not enough welfare support and there's, you know, people, OST patients couldn't reach um, the centers. So what, what, what needs to be improved? And you have two minutes to answer that. Um, well, first of all, I believe that uh, we need uh, support uh, of uh, community-based systems, actually, because what we see now a lot, we see a lot of support related to masks, uh, sanitizers, uh, stuff like that, uh, personal protective equipment and so on. But let's not forget that the, uh, is the initiative of the Global Fund, uh, which uh, has been supporting the Global Fund, uh, and now they are announcing the next round of this uh, support related to COVID. It also includes the support of community system and not just giving certain number of masks or sanitizer, which is of course important, but let's important uh, than having an organized community that monitors where the problem is, uh, monitors it and makes advocacy to change uh, the situation because, it, like they say in Russian, uh, it always breaks uh, where, where it uh, is most likely to break. And we, we got those breaks in so many numbers that if we didn't get the um, signals from the um, community, I think the access uh, to services would be even worse than now. And uh, that is why the second word that I'd like to say is a very important, uh, we, we need flexibility in support because if we continue living with the idea that um, we, uh, this is the way we used to work and we cannot do it in any other way, that's a disaster. The COVID showed that everything must change really quickly, do not be afraid of innovations, do not be afraid of new approaches, take risks, make attempts, implement innovations and the practice shows that it does bring results. The same goes for the flexibility of fund and, and I had addressed that to the global fund during our meetings with them and I will repeat it now. If this support, financial support is focused only on mask sanitizers and numbers of tests and uh, for antigens and so on, but uh, they will not cover the basic needs transportation, uh, we wish to reach the sites to receive the, the, the medicines, uh, in this case, OST uh, legal support that is so much required uh, by our people, because people are facing catastrophic um, failure to enjoy their rights. Uh, so if those fund, funds are spent uh, to, for this support of communities, then I am sure uh, the, well, the, that's the only way to uh, ensure that the, the, the money is used effectively. That's briefly about that. But we also speak yeah. a lot about services, about how it should work. But uh, let's uh, uh, think about the fact that uh, this year, in addition to the services, we had to fight against a number of uh, legislative initiatives related to repressive drug policies, Unfortunately, our geopolitical uh, neighbors um, in the north, uh, they also have their negative influence and uh, really unfortunate that uh, a lot of politicians, uh, they keep creating more problems for us, not really related to COVID, but when they hit us in the period when we are fighting COVID and trying to survive and they keep uh, kicking us again with new stuff. Uh, add a new repressions, uh, some pro drug propaganda stuff, some forced treatment, and we need to fight against the stupid initiatives. That's also, I think, uh, doesn't make our um, COVID response easier to do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anton, and thanks as well for, for raising, you know, issues about the conflict as well. That
that's much appreciated. And we have to move on quite quickly. So I want to introduce um, uh, our speaker from Kyrgyzstan, Ibar Sultan Gaziev, who will be speaking about the COVID impacts on HIV and TB key populations. Um, Ibar, uh, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a lot has already been said, so I'm not going to uh, keep speaking about the problems and uh, my presentation will be open soon. I will start with a different stuff. Well, uh, could, could we show the next slide, please? The beginning, the onset of epidemic started in mid-March and we saw the situation, we, we already had seen the situation in Europe, what was going on there, and the, approximately at 25th of March, we had our first large lockdown, uh, full lockdown. And uh, you know that by mid-March, uh, seeing what was going on around the world and understanding that, uh, the, well, we, we really uh, were going to have, have a full disaster and real changes in our ways of life. So in mid-March, we initiated uh, this, um, well, a lot of changes in uh, well, uh, releasing AR, ART drugs and methadone and so on. So by the end of March, we've produced this detailed plan covering five areas including continuity of care, continuity of funding, and uh, reduction of risks of uh, COVID infection and social support. And in, uh, first, and in early April, this uh, plan was stopped. And um, we, fought, we were following this plan all through the uh, summer of 2020, and it's been implemented even now. Next slide, please. Uh, so, of course, it is clear that, like in all the countries, uh, based on the results, uh, we, we got uh, the drops in uh, the numbers of tests, and uh, it was like 10-15% of reduction uh, drop in uh, case finding of tuberculosis, in particular resistant tuberculosis uh, last year in the second and uh, third quarters of the year, especially next slide. And uh, uh, according to the plan, uh, we were trying to, yeah, it was it, like, it was clear that we had to act in a totally new way in the emergency situation. And uh, this can also be called almost a warlike condition. And we had to really change our ways of work really fast. And I wanted to say that the, area of HIV and tuberculosis, HIV probably more is where they already had the outreach workers, mobile teams, they were better prepared than all the other areas in healthcare to COVID situation by that time and uh, that they had the resources, they had human resources, people who had already worked with infections and they had the understanding of, the, of how to work with them. Uh, so, as I've already said, in March, in late March, uh, uh, the ART drugs uh, uh, started uh, being released for a longer term methadone for five days, that was maximum. maximum. Uh, the, before the lockdown, uh, all around the sites, uh, they received stocks of uh, condoms and syringes and to, were told to, to give them the, the stock for at least one month for all the um, uh, clients. And another important moment was that we had this understanding that a lot of our people, a lot of people with HIV, they live in migration, they live in Russia and Kazakhstan, and we also established a mechanism to supply um, uh, the mechanism to cooperate with our partners from Russia with ITPC, so uh, that was done to ensure delivery of um, uh, the drugs for our citizens. And approximately in May, uh, we started implementing uh, this plan really on a larger scale and uh, introduced, well, all resources that uh, we had, uh, we started using to buy PPEs, 
uh, antiseptic sanitizers uh, and we revised the mechanisms for testing and implemented self-testing. So there is uh, field workers just uh, they, they keep distance and they tell how to make a, a self-test and they explain that to the person uh, and NGOs in cooperation with uh, the state service for HIV and tuberculosis implemented uh, mobile teamwork and delivered together the TB trucks uh, doing localized testing. So we did all that and uh, of course, we had to switch to on, online testing and uh, started using um, tablets and so on. And uh, of course, we had to provide training on how to work uh, following uh, the requirements of infection control. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Yeah, I will continue. As to the uh, uninterrupted funding, we were concerned that uh, under the conditions of disruption of supply chains, global supply chains, uh, that the drugs price would go up. And we focused on that especially. We, decide, we even managed to get the pre-COVID prices even lower prices than during the COVID times for a monthly um course of um, antiretrovirals for TLD and for anti-TB drugs. Since our country has had a plan in advance, we were one of the first to um, get to the funding for the first round of anti for adjustment on the COVID conditions, we got $860,000. Uh, we got support to civil sector, to mobile teams. It was very difficult to move around. People had nothing to eat. There was no transportation. Uh, we were buying food packages, etc. So under the conditions of COVID, it was difficult to procure medicines and the law that we have been promoting through international organizations for a long time about uh, public procurement, the government finally understood that the state itself needs this. Next slide. I already mentioned the social support. Basically all of our NGOs of all possible funds have tried to provide support to their vulnerable groups, to their respective groups. I may even give rather modest figures here about lots and lots of various services and assistance was provided. Uh, food products, uh, shelter, food for shelters, etc. Regarding migrants living with HIV, we were trying to find at least one person who was left without drugs, and I think we managed to cover all the needs there. Uh, also, transportation costs were increased. So this was the brief picture. Again, I took quite a bit of your time. I know one thing th there that under these conditions, we should have been working in a totally different way. And we should have worked uh, for the preservation of the programs and the preservation of the people under our programs, under our control. We didn't always manage that. We know the cases of late uh, uh, HIV detection, um, COVID uh, departments have received um, the people with new HIV cases. And we now continue the work to make sure that uh, COVID departments, COVID units uh, start testing for HIV and TB. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ibar. And it's it's really very interesting. And I'd, I'd be really keen to hear um, later from you on, on what needs to be improved and what needs to be done immediately to make sure that vulnerable populations get access to funding. Um, so I'm going to go into reflections um, on the study outcomes from myself and Pavel, who prepared the study and who interviewed people in, in countries. And I'm going to try to, because we are over time, so I'm going to do this very quickly and come up with some top line um, headlines for each country. So I'm doing three countries. In, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, it's obvious that we need massive influx of funding into, into the country because um, services for MSM and harm reduction services in particular are, you know, are, are massively unsustainable. Um, there's also massive stigma for men who have sex with men. Um, and so the services for men who have sex with men are just not adapted to serve people there. And of course, um, HIV infections among MSM have tripled in recent years uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, so there's a, a real ne necessity to um, invest in, in working uh, on these populations. One thing that also came out of um, Bosnia-Herzegovina was that there isn't a strong civil society on TB there, which is really problematic because it's seen predominantly as a clinical condition and without any social aspects. So that's obviously something that needs to be worked on. On Georgia, I was I was very impressed with Georgia. Um, the, 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 in the COVID response, I was impressed by the leadership. Um, clinical hotels were very interesting to me, how there were in the initial stages, uh, doctors and nurses within hotels. Um, these were quarantine hotels for patients, uh, for people traveling into the country and um, services were provided there. Of course, you've heard from Nino about the impressive TB, TB innovations um, that have been instituted to uh, recover the reduced detection rate in TB. So that's been really impressive. Something that also stood out for me was at time of writing, and this may have increased since time of writing, is that five people living with HIV died of COVID-19 complications. And um, after that, what happened was they expanded the work of the mobile brigade and they provided PLHIV with um, medicines at home and introduced online consultation. So that was very interesting. Another interesting thing from Georgia was that the price of street drug drugs in increased threefold. And um, you know that's a horrible financial burden on people who use drugs. In addition to that, many ex-prisoners in, in Georgia worked as construction workers. And during COVID, of course, they lost these jobs. And, um, and you know, it, when people lose their jobs and, and have to struggle to even find food, um, you know, they're not going to focus on, on whether it's HIV or TB treatment. So, you know, these are massive, financial situation is obviously a massive deterrent to people sticking to treatment. Um, and just final uh, reflections for Moldova is, um, of course, you heard that there was a six month supply of ARVs um, and they were walking outreach services and mobile units um, used to um, deliver ARVs to remote regions. There was a concern because um, there were stockouts and I see Dr. Dr. Yuri is on, on the call today, so maybe he can answer better and describe this uh, in question and answer later, but there was a switch over uh, from methadone to, uh, um, to, to methadone from buprenorphine due to stockouts. We also learned that in Moldova, active case finding uh, via mobile x-ray screening has stopped um, and it was also good um, that the Ministry of Health um, issued a decree to empower the NGOs uh, in TB detection, which you, of course, heard um, um, Lillian talk about. So those are my highlights of, of what I took from the research um, and would be keen to hear from Dr. Yuri, you're, you're on um, about the stockouts in particular. Nice to meet you. As I understood, I needed to present something, correct? No, you yes. mentioned that. 
Yeah, if you could just um, uh, just uh, maybe two two lines on the health. Sure. Um, it's not that we have drugs for six months. We issue the drugs for six months. This happened before COVID as well, because my colleagues from other countries with lots of people um, are traveling to other countries for work. So we issue them larger stocks. In the cases of labor migrants traveling to other countries to work, we could issue them a six months uh, stock. And uh, because of COVID, we use this practice a lot so that people didn't have to travel to the treatment center and collect their drugs. And this helped in the COVID times a lot. As to methadone, It so happened that the next procurement had to come from Italy and it was taking too long. So as a result, we had to reorient ourselves. And we, had, we did fast procurement at the national level, not through the international platforms because methadone is being procured by the state for three years now. And we found our own opportunities to procure that urgently, procure methadone urgently, to make sure um, uh, the substitution therapy goes uninterrupted. Before COVID, there were only some individuals getting the drug for three to five days. And in the conditions of COVID, this was basically a forced measure. And almost all of the patients were receiving the drug for five to six days, sometimes even for seven days. So under these conditions, we managed to resolve these problems. And basically it's similar to what the colleagues were saying. Um, mobile clinics were taking the drugs around during the lockdown syringe replacement program, substitution programs, uh, outreach uh, workers have joined in the effort. And uh, basically we managed to avoid the interruptions in drug supply, in methadone issuance and substitution therapy and harm reduction programs. And basically, we didn't have so much shortage. It might sound odd, but uh, it wasn't so bad. And uh, infectionists could uh, reorient themselves to COVID centers. And in one center, a, a nurse had to issue the drugs as an exception again, because a doctor was sick with COVID and another one was working at COVID center. But this was the situation and uh, it got handled. There was also a problem with medical staff, not only with our beneficiaries, but still it worked out. And all these measures could be resolved uh, by phone, through online consultations, etc. We have kind of found our way around this situation because COVID is new for everyone, not just for us. So we have been searching for ways to handle this. Uh, we were trying to send drugs abroad, to send medicines to them, find, try to find ways um, to provide drugs to medicines for patients who got stuck abroad to make sure that their treatment goes uninterrupted in the COVID times. I cannot say this is a great thing, of course, uh, because the lockdown is over and now our, well, now Moldova doesn't have a problem uh, with uh, movement around the country. You can take a train, a car, whatever you like. It's a problem to travel outside Moldova, but not within Moldova. And it turns out that the patient started calling us and saying, you know, we really liked it that you are taking the drugs to us, to our village, for example, closer to us. We would like this to be something done on a regular basis. And again, clearly it's not a great thing for us doctors. 
one thing is extreme conditions and another thing is that you know we need to take a viral load test we need to ask the patients about uh, their state of health so there's a bit of negativity there but still people understand the problems thank you and this drug delivery was at that time was a great practice but now when they're waiting for us to bring the medicines to them it may not be so great our distances are not big in some countries you need to travel 200 300 kilometers to treatment center but we are a small country and it's not a problem to travel and the centers are distributed around the country three 30 50 kilometers it's not a problem to travel uh, once every six months that's the brief overview if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer this is what we did in moldova to make sure that COVID doesn't impact our um, hiv patients so much unfortunately we don't take the statistics as to the number of hiv patients who had COVID. Uh, only if they tell us during the uh, um, standard examination, regular examination that they had COVID, um, then we know. Uh, we know of four cases of co-infection of uh, HIV, TB, and uh, COVID, and they died. And one patient with TB and COVID who died, and she was a fresh um, a new case. Um, I don't have any other official figures. So if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Doctor, um, for your reflections uh, and for your um, ad hoc comments uh, and uh, apologies for putting you on the spot that way. But thank you so much. Um, uh, let's go to Pavel Akhtanov. Pavel, who has been my partner in crime through this work. Uh, Pavel, if you have some top line reflections about Russia and Kyrgyzstan, um, it will be much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Pavel. You have the floor. Thank you. Yes, I have some um, observations and a lot has been said about all of the countries except for Russia. So I will not repeat the things that have been said before. I will start with results of the study on Russia. I'll share our key results. And then if there are any further questions, I can clarify them as we go along. I can start by saying that Russia is the fourth um, biggest uh, COVID, has the highest, fourth highest COVID rate uh, disease burden. We had 4.5 uh, million of cases and almost 92,000 of deaths. Um, no emergency situation was declared in the country. However, all regions one way or another from March to July were in a state of uh, severe lockdown based on local decisions of local authorities. And the situation uh, is no different there from the other countries. And of course, that significantly affected access to services to HIV and TB. And we have to know that, some that the country has uh, closed down the opportunities for many uh, treatment options. And in general, the study has shown a serious level of uh, non-sustainability to this, uh, um, these challenges. There were lots of problems. They were quite acute. There were a number of problems. A number of tests went down for HIV and TB on different assessments and official data. TB testing went down by at least 15%. HIV infection detection rate went down by 13, almost 14%. Even though according to some of the poll participants, this figure could be higher. Detection rate of TB went down by 36% compared with uh, 2019, the pre-pandemic year. 
And this happened largely due to the fact that many patients and medical institutions uh, had same problems as in other countries. They had to reorient to COVID patients and increase the level burden as a result, general stress among COVID patient, social and economic stress because many people lost their jobs and had difficulties in terms of transportation access to HIV centers and TB treatment centers. According to another study that we'd also studied, at least 30% uh, of all patients with HIV infections face such problems. And yet another thing needs to be mentioned about harm reduction programs. This was probably uh, the, the sphere that suffered most because before the pandemic, the coverage of harm reduction programs was rather fragmented and limited because uh, after the global fund reduced, went out, left uh, this um, country, the coverage uh, went significantly down and uh, the um, Organizations that provide these programs are under a lot of pressure because of conservative state uh, policy on drug uh, prevention and other issues. You may have heard- Some organizations have been considered uh, foreign agents and they struggle really hard now. The pandemic itself has also added to our pain and sometimes we had to stop our work because of the risk of infection. In some regions, uh, the programs continued working like in Chelyabinsk Oblast, uh, even though with some restrictions. Anyway, uh, the, we, we did a lot of work and um, we were really impressed by our respondents who agreed to uh, tell us about uh, the situation they were, they had to work in and survive. And if we speak about tuberculosis, there are some problems as well, even though the national uh, system for tuberculosis treatment continued working, uh, though, though, of course, uh, the number, the, the case find and uh, worsened, but uh, the cascade of problems was uh, broader and uh, and we are speaking about the access to health care facilities as well, and in some regions, uh, uh, the, the, there was overcrowding of uh, healthcare facilities. People were afraid to go there. And of course, measures of socioeconomic support were very scarce uh, this, in order to ensure people's uh, patients adherence to treatment. Uh, there, there were problems with implementing innovations such as uh, VST uh, in Russia. It doesn't exist yet, or it's not widespread at least. And uh, of course, it also uh, increased stress on uh, non-government organizations who had to uh, work actively in this area as well. So I know that all the data is in the report. There are many uh, recommendations about uh, all sorts of countries and Russia included. And I see in the comments uh, to our web webinar, a very good notion about uh, the, the lack of um, uh, emergency psychological care for patients. It's a characteristic not just for Ukraine, but also for other, for other countries, Russia, the rest of them, because uh, the stress was high, uh, really high for the patients, and a few of them were capable of dealing with it. And uh, I would even add uh, our, to our recommendations, uh, psychosocial support should be included because uh, uh, you know, these uh, financial problems, uh, they also play a big part when people could not reach aid centers because, and sometimes they had no food uh, to eat uh, because of uh, dropping their income. And among the most serious recommendations, we can mention uh, development of the component of uh, psychosocial support uh, 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 through community-based programs. And I think these are the most important point, the points that I wanted to mention right now. And if you have uh, questions or things to clarify, I see they already have written something in the chat and we can speak about that. I will be happy to answer. Tifa, thanks.
Thanks so much, Pavel. Um, we have one more presentation before we go to Q and A, and and Pavel's of course in charge of collecting all the questions in the chat and referring them, um, referring to them in the question and answer session. And we're over time, but we're going to make sure we have question and answer. Um, James Mala from TB Partnership, um, if you can provide your brief comments um, on what's going on in Stop TB programs, um, that will be great. Thank you, and you have the floor. Thanks so much, Fifa and Pavel. Um, congratulations on the on the work, and um, you know also on behalf of Stop TB, thanks for the opportunity to participate uh, in the process. So I note that the the discussion and comments have been rich, and you want you want the Q and A. So I'll move quite quickly and just try to make a couple of points. I think you know listening to the reflections, what's really important is to understand the extent um, that this is that this is impacting countries all around the region and around the world. And the modeling that we have you know to date suggests that there'll be an additional six point three million people um, developing TB, an additional one point four million deaths worldwide, and this will set back the um, TB response, as we've sort of heard in a lot of the country examples by by five to eight years, and in, and in some more recent notification data, um, up to sort of 12 years as well. I note that there's been a, a range of other work like, um, that complements some of the, the, this particular project in, in, in the space for TB, and a lot of the findings that have been found at this country level um, have also been you know, seen in this impact of COVID on the TB epidemic and community respective. And it's really important, I think, to really understand um, these experiences at the country level and to develop, you know, nuanced and country specific plans to, to respond to respond to the, the challenge that, that all of these countries are faced with. Something that I think is also really important to consider at the moment is the fact that um, whilst, whilst the sort of the global deaths for COVID are, um, have made it the leading infectious killer, in, in global fund eligible countries, TB still remains that leading, that leading sort of killer. And I note that there's some guidance that's come out from the Global Fund, which is an information note looking at catch-up plans for TB. And uh, we know that in the next few days that there's the, the financing for the, for the, the CR19 RM um, will be released to countries. So everyone, all the countries who are Global Fund eligible who are on, on this call, just to be aware, that as your country develops your COVID sort of funding requests to think about all of the findings from the report that's, that you've talked about today and make sure that you work to incorporate responses that very much focus um, on not just strengthening the health systems, but also the, the TB and TBHIV responses as well. Um, it'll be a significant opportunity to have increased investment and something that I wanted to make sure you're all aware of. I know that um, in terms of global level commitments, that there's, um, that there's particular challenges that have been posed by COVID. And just at the end of last year, there were two reports, one released by the UN Secretary General and one released by the T global TB community, both of which talk about the, the need to, prevent, to protect TB programs against the challenges of, of COVID-19. And in the case of the community response, to, to really leverage COVID-19 as a strategic opportunity for NTB. And in many ways that links with my previous point about looking to see how you can have integrated TB, TB and COVID responses at the country level. So I note that there's a range of call to actions and the challenges in TB and many of these have been discussed at the country level. So I won't go into detail, but just to note that all of the global level targets, and this is linked to the question around what challenges has Stop TB faced. So all of the global targets face enhanced challenges, both uh, new challenges and exacerbated initial, you know, existing challenges around reaching all the people um, through TB diagnosis, treatment and care, around issues of human rights, equity, gender, and stigma, uh, on, on accelerating the development of, of, of TB tools, on investments in TB, on TB accountability, and then specific challenges also around COVID-19 as well. Um, and so there's a range of different you know, uh, findings that we have there, but I guess linking to the discussions that we've already heard today, um, that there is a critical need to make sure that we use this as an opportunity to, to not just get back on track, but to build back better. And there's a lot of lessons that we have historically through TB, through HIV, but also more recently with, with COVID-19 that we really need to be cognizant of and incorporate into our, into our efforts going forward. 
So again, I note that the, the, here's a summary on the screen of some of the, the points that, that I've made. And at the bottom, I just added this, this highlighted point, which is very much about the fact that in many of your countries, you will have an opportunity to um, produce some proposals, uh, to develop some interventions that respond to the COVID challenges in your country. And just to be very aware that um, it would be a strategic opportunity to come up with um, different interventions so that, that can strengthen health systems, community systems, and also benefit both TB and COVID responses. These things could include things like bi-directional testing, um, having TB and COVID screening um, and case finding efforts integrated, um, having community-led monitoring for TB and COVID. And I note that there was some monitoring comments from Anton and others earlier as well. Um, and also broader you know, surveillance and support efforts as well. And I note that the mental health angle has already been touched upon, but I think that that's something you know, really critical to be able to utilize this report that we're discussing today and turn it into sort of actionable items in the very near future. Here's some links to the, firstly, the accountability report that I said, and then the last bullet point at the bottom is the information note from the Global Fund on TB and COVID catch-up plans, which might be something you, you know, benefit for all of you. And with that, I'll leave my comments there, noting the time and say thank you again to, to FIFA, to Pavel, and to all the hosts for the opportunity to engage today. Thank you. Thanks so much, James, for that. And, and thanks for your support through the study as well. Um, I'm passing to Pavel now to, to go into questions and, and hopefully we have some time to, to get back to you on those questions before we end uh, today. Pavel. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat that have not been answered yet. I hope uh, I will try to Post them on the screen. Do you see it? Yeah, we do see it. Yes, yes, we do, Pavel. Very well. Uh, the, the, we have a very uh, difficult question from Dimitri. The question was uh, to Lilian at the beginning, and but it's also to the rest of our participants as well, about the incidence rate of uh, COVID-19 among TB patients and how the COVID-19 has affected the mortality rate among TB patients. I don't know whether Lilian has the answer to this question or maybe someone else could comment on this. The answer in Russian or English, what will be more convenient? Any language you choose. It's just that if you speak uh, uh, Russian, be in the Russian channel. Okay, so we we'll speak in English. Our uh, specialist, uh, specialists at the NTP, but unfortunately, I can, I can, uh, I can, I can't give any figure on that now at the moment. Uh, it's obvious that uh, I can tell you about uh, vulnerable populations and I can tell you that uh, we have uh, undetected COVID-19 among uh, these populations, which makes uh, our work, work much more harder uh, because often uh, I think um, at the, even at the X-ray, uh, we can see changes in the lungs and uh, we don't know what it is and with, with the subsequent uh, 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 difficulties. Um, one of our tasks is to, uh, to understand how can we screen them for COVID as well, because uh, it would make our work uh, easier. Uh. May I add to this? Yes, Ibar, please. Well, according to our statistics, uh, preliminarily, uh, some figures vary, actually, but the mortality from tuberculosis has increased. So there are no studies uh, saying that it's co-infection, death or something. 
about uh, as people started uh, coming to us with uh, more severe uh, forms of tuberculosis. And if you speak about drug resistant tuberculosis, uh, the mortality has increased. And I see that here among the participants, we have our uh, Deputy Director for Science of the National TB uh, Care Center. Maybe she could tell us, uh, but I think that there is a 15 to 20 percent, uh, at least 10 to 15 percent growth in mortality. Thank you very much, Ebar. Uh, do we have a comments on, on that? Yes, I would like to add to, to this. Can I speak? Yes, please. It's great that you're with us. Ibar has uh, spoken about the situation with TB in our country. According to the statistics, the level of tuberculosis, registered uh, tuberculosis, we, we receive, you know, annual reports. We have uh, significantly less cases of new cases of tuberculosis registered. And we are now getting new patients that had already uh, received a treatment uh, for several months or half a year. They come to us with COVID and they have uh, late stages of tuberculosis now, DRTB. And well, before uh, we didn't uh, uh, see patients with cachexia, now we see it because uh, uh, they, they had been treated in several courses, uh, several regimens, but uh, got no effect. And uh, while at the first stage, uh, the, uh, the way we worked with them, they didn't uh, control it uh, with x-rays. So after several courses of treatment, they come to us and uh, we also test them for COVID and then test them for TB. And uh, then we see that patients have a late stages of tuberculosis requiring a lot of efforts to treat. And talking about uh, the increase of mortality, I cannot uh, confirm that because uh, the mortality rate among well, per, per 100,000 population uh, used to be 3.6 and now it's approximately the same. Maybe in a quarter, we will see uh, true figures, but so far we, we are really surprised with this uh, that we don't see the increase in mortality. Maybe people uh, did not uh, like uh, may made the decision that it was death of tuberculosis and maybe a lot of uh, patients were uh, registered as people who died because of COVID. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think I can add that in our study, we tried to, to highlight this pro pro problem as well. It was included in the questions that we asked, but uh, telling about some structured data is too early so far. We have not found those. And uh, in particular, if you speak about uh, the, the, uh, the TB service from Ukraine, they also said that they had preliminary data about the reduction of mortality caused by TB, but uh, so far, it is uh, explained mostly by the fact that uh, a lot of patients were lost to follow up during the pandemic and they could die uh, of other diseases. And of course, that's a great problem because it seems that a lot of patients uh, receive no control, no follow up. And uh, so far, we have not been able to find any structured data, and I think that some of the results of our study were the questions that require further uh, look into. And uh, the, the thing Dmitry is asking here is very important, and that's a thing that we need to pay special attention to. FIFA, maybe you would like to add something to this? No, I'm happy for you to go forward with the questions. Uh, let's move on. A question from Kay Lawler uh, to Marka from Georgia. And the question is uh, how much uh, the reduction of office activities of NGOs 
uh, influenced uh, coordination of the national harm reduction activities in terms of service and organizational events. How did uh, the lockdown impact it? Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, question, Kale. Yes, really, COVID uh, made unable for most uh, NGOs to work on advocacy issues uh, as uh, there was difficulty to reach uh, uh, the offices and we were all working from the distance. Even now I am sitting at home <laughs> because we still have some restrictions uh, gathering together. Um, uh, yes, but uh, uh, we failed to uh, conduct uh, local advocacy meetings uh, moving from one city to in an another, but uh, mostly uh, national or broader meetings are held in uh, Zoom. Uh, the, this is really very flexible now for maybe everyone to in time and coordination, but face-to-face -face meetings really had different effect, I think. Thank you. May I also? May I? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also planned in last year to finish the budget advocacy uh, activities. But when in March started the lockdown, uh, all activities it's, it's finished. But we are planning uh, to uh, we are send the amendments of the law act on exceeds uh, duties, and uh, our proposal stay in the parliament almost two years. And uh, we want to, to, to finish this process with this process we uh, collected uh, 22 million euros per year and we want to, to uh, invest th this uh, money in two type of activities for hiv and mtb and uh, uh, establishing the, the fund for treatment of uh, youth and uh, children with uh, uh, heart diseases uh, and uh, this this pandemic uh, stopped all activities and uh, our uh, politician and uh, the uh, opinion uh, makers in, in the government structure uh, uh, don't want to, to work uh, on, on, on this uh, and also don't want anything on the, the, the COVID uh, crisis. We are only uh, a country who don't have uh, uh, buy any uh, one dose of the vaccine and uh, all uh, doses of vaccine almost 35,000 uh, citizens of the Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, go to the Serbia and uh, the use this these vaccines and uh, also we have a donation uh, from uh, three uh, different uh, sources, government of uh, 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 Slovenia, government of uh, Serbia, and the government of uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, finally. And all other activities, it's a stop it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Colleagues, we have five to seven minutes. We have two more questions. Outstanding questions keep coming in, but I think we will be able to uh, provide answers in full responses on the studies. Question to Yuri, perhaps from Moldova. Why um, buprenorphine was unavailable for two months? Why only in two cities? Well, why buprenorphine wasn't there for two months? Only because it had to be procured from Italy and there were tough restrictions there because of the lockdown. And the producer could not provide it on time. They provided it with a delay. But we provided methadone and nothing got interrupted. 
Why only two cities? I cannot explain this in two words right now. But thing is, substitution therapy is provided by an oncology service. And the processes that should uh, be developed further, well, they cannot be affected. But we need to expand this availability further for methadone and buprenorphine throughout the territory of the Republic. There was also a question about vaccination. I'd like to say that, by the way, Moldova has not procured a single dose of vaccine for, against COVID-19. We only have it available from COVAX platform and donors' um, contributions. Romania has provided 200,000 doses. But the first stage of doctors' uh, vaccination is over, was over, and now the second stage includes all people all citizens 18 plus with comorbidities. And the list of comorbidities includes immune diseases and chronic diseases like TB. So basically you can go to a family doctor, to your family physician, and you can get your vaccine. I don't know about your other countries, but we feel that Generally, the population is very negative about vaccination. And I'm envious uh, when I hear that Israel says that they've already vaccinated 50% of the population. In a few months, they will have 70%. I think in Moldova, it's going to be a very difficult process of vaccination. There's lots of uh, people who want to refuse the vaccine. Thank you. Andre Dadu was uh, raising the hand and then put it down again. Do you have a comment? Yes, thank you very much once again. On behalf of the WHO, I'd like to thank APH and FIFA personally for organizing this uh, great um, event. My question was regarding emphasizing two categories of the population, people living with HIV and TB. What's the attitude to them? Are they a separate category for the purposes of uh, extension of vaccination in the second phase? And how do countries view this population? And again, if any experience with vaccination for these categories is available, it would be very interesting to hear that. Thank you. Colleagues, I'm not sure we have the time because these are very important and big questions. If you have a quick comment from countries, and let's hear one comment on that. Yes, as far as I understand, I think all key groups as many groups are considered criminalized. And outside of the general vaccination system, these um, categories need to be um, receiving first rate access to vaccines. As to Ukraine, we don't have much, uh, you know, success to report. The Q through D app is not moving. We have the category of say social workers and only because the first vaccines we'd received were AstraZeneca with a 10 dose package. So when you open one, you need to have uh, basically 10 patients to vaccinate. And then by some miracle, our partners among 
NGOs and um, people in the community of HIV AIDS, they managed to somehow jump on that train of vaccination of leftovers. We also have the initiatives like uh, there's another Q in Kyiv for opinion leaders. And you can expect for some leftovers if you're some kind of public person. And as a famous activist, I filled out that uh, uh, questionnaire, but so far there's no response. So in answer to the questions of colleagues from HIVs, from um, uh, WHO, I believe that uh, some key groups should have uh, a primary access to uh, sort of have a priority to receive this vaccine. But in reality, they are, well, we're very far from the figures that the government plans to have. There should be millions of vaccinated persons right now, and we have like some tens of thousands. And we have not covered all the primary population groups, doctors, the military, etc. Unfortunately, that's the case. Thank you, Anton. Question from uh, Yelena Wolf from WHO. Are there countries present here where HIV patients are part of the priority vaccination list? It's the same question, basically. Okay, no more comments for now, right? Uh, people uh, can be honest, uh, we prioritize this. Anton, uh, Pavel, can, can, I, can I jump in here? Yes. Um, да, коллеги, еще раз хотелось бы подчеркнуть. Yes, colleagues, I would very much like to emphasize this once again. That the second phase of extension of vaccine coverage includes people 60 plus and people with co-infections, comorbidities, or some risk factors that can affect um, severe morbidity of, or even mortality from COVID-19. So a priori, And people living with uh, HIV, uh, IDUs and others are sort of a separate category there. And I wanted to emphasize that. But in general, I'd like to emphasize once again that all people, uh, well, all people living with HIV, including IDUs, and TB patients, uh, they are eligible and they can request that if they have not been included in the list yet. And it's correct, first come, first served. No one is pushing anyone, but uh, they believe that this vaccination is important to preserve their health, they are eligible for this service. Thank you. Thanks very much. I believe we need to wrap up. We have still one wonderful question from Kale from Ireland once again. What would we like to have before the pandemic? What we wish we'd had before the pandemic? I think we all wish we hadn't had it. It's a bit of a rhetorical question, but still an interesting question and we can end with it. Are there any comments? What we wish we'd had before the pandemic that we did, that we'd done before the pandemic that could make our uh, situation easier now. Okay, I guess it's about readiness, other features. We'd be curious to hear your comments. 
Okay. If there are no more comments, any sort of pressing issues, then I'd like to give floor to FIFA. The floor is yours, FIFA. Thank you so much, Pavel. And um, I, I am closing this um, session and apologies for the hand raised we're, we're already quite strongly over time um, and um, please send through your questions um, to our emails we, we're happy to divert them to the necessary um, stakeholders to respond um, it was a pleasure working on this report and, and so much work more to be done um, including in strengthening community systems for TB, including improving testing for HIV and, and increased funding for particular uh, uh, countries, of course. So, so thank you everyone for joining uh, and we look forward to following up with you and, and um, helping your advocacy in country. Thank you very much indeed. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you.